Since, since Wednesday night. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, no, you're all right. Go ahead, Tom. Oh, Wednesday night's talk was beautiful. And since Wednesday night, every time I was going to go the other way, which was the easy way out, I turned and went, did what I was supposed to do, and went against it. Okay. And it just, uh, there's going to be, uh, there's nothing but work to do. Okay. There's been a great deal of talk about work parties, and some students say they can work on themselves better by not going. Could you comment on that? Not going to work parties? You don't have to go to work party if you don't want to. Just watch out for Richard. <laughs> Did you have your hand up, John? Yeah. I, I feel like I'm at a standstill, like I'm not getting any more out of it than I have in the last five months. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you told us before that we could be as scared as we want to be and shake as much as we want to. Would that be on a different level than... Yeah, you have, you have to go through knowledge of your shaking. When I tell you to shake all you want, that is very definite in the elementary stage, which you know what you're really like. And if you come to the end of that, the shaking will stop, but you have to go to the very end of it. See, when I tell you, you don't have to be afraid, that's still a fact. But uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight covers that too. There's a number of things it's going to cover. Any last minute before we start? The new Desi Tape Offer is a real attractive commercial piece that entices you to purchase it, the tape, and then when you hear it, it's just one of the most powerful tapes. It'll just really jolt anyone, I'm sure. Well, they're mailed out tomorrow, I guess, aren't they, Richard? Yeah. The first Desi Tapes. Huh? <clears throat> Do I look good for my collar? Hello. Amy, would you want to change it? Didn't Duffy do right? Amy, I invite you. I mean, you look so critical. <laughs> okay, are we on? The proof of truth is found on the other side of the proof of falsehood. Repeat. The proof of truth is found on the other side of the proof of falsehood. This means you have to go through falsehood, a thousand varieties, in order to understand it as falsehood, which destroys it, the understanding of it destroys it, and brings you out on the other side where truth exists. The whole world asks the following question. What is truth? What's it all about? Is there evidence that truth exists? If so, how do I find it? Now, of all the millions of human beings who ask that question, there are very few who ever do what you're going to hear about tonight for you to do in which you can know from yourself absolutely from your whole psychic system that truth exists. But you have to do the work, you have to go into action on what I'm going to tell you about tonight. You see, when you ask the question, what is truth, 
what's it all about? Where can I find it? When you ask that question, you had better have your work clothes on. Because anyone can say what is truth is a philosophical question or is their contribution to a discussion around the table. Anyone can do that. You have to mean what you're talking about because so much is required of you if you're really going to answer the question, what is truth? You can know the answer, but the answer is definitely not on the level of the asking of the question. And here's where practically everyone makes a mistake. You ask, what is truth? And then in our distorted minds, as experiences unfold before us, we lose sight of even the small bit of sincerity and earnestness we had at the start when we asked the question. We asked the question, what is truth? And then we go out into the world and forget the question because we found our own answer. So we don't even ask the question anymore because we ask at the start, what is truth? And what we really mean, what is truth according to my own desires, which is the disaster. A person says he's sincere about wanting the answers to life, the answers to his existence here on earth. Then he goes out into the world and he runs to an attraction, an attraction of some kind. He runs into a nice man, a nice woman, runs into his career, and that becomes his truth. And it becomes so overwhelmingly that he gets involved in this kind of a success that if you ask him later on what is truth, he has nothing left but to answer you in terms of his own acquisition. What is truth? Truth is what I have won for myself in this world. All the money or all the fame. Or all the very pleasant, dreamy ideas he has, she has about himself as having himself, having it made, of being secure. Now back to the point. Don't miss the original point. Because this is the very key thought of the whole talk tonight. Truth and proof of it is found on the other side of the proof of falsehood. Ah! Now we've got a starting point. In order for anyone to find truth, to arrive at the region of light, he can't start with truth. How can you start with truth when you don't know what it is? And I just explained we soon distort things into our own ideas of truth, which is not truth at all, but simply our own self-glorified desires. So we finally have to start into proof of confusion, proof of being lost, proof of falsehood in every way. Now at the same time that it is the easiest thing to do, it's the most difficult. Because at this point, human stubbornness comes in, human conceit comes in, so that a person doesn't want to go through the wilderness of his internal self in order to come out on the other side. He doesn't want to go into it because to go into it, you first have to admit that it's there to go into. All these fiery feelings, all these little pet sarcasms that we have inside of us, all these greeds, this is the lost state. This is a false state, correct? Now for me to go into it, to even take one step inside of it, I have to say, that's the way I really am. How divided I am inwardly, how I smile a lot but don't really mean it. And how I hide from myself my confusion and I call myself a truth seeker, for example. It is not even easy to take the first step into the lost state because then you'd have to admit that you don't know anything at all and never have. Have you ever noticed how 
easily a person will admit that he doesn't know how to cook very well or he's not very good at uh, repairing the house. Have you ever noticed those things? As a matter of fact, those are petty brags, aren't they? I don't know. How, no, I don't. He's just bragging that he doesn't know something. Those things are relatively easy to admit. Get into the psychology of a human being where his sense of self is involved and you'll see something quite different. Even though outwardly he might admit, oh, I don't know much about life, I'm, I'm, I'm a very confused man. He's saying that outwardly without really meaning it. This means that he won't take even the first step into seeing his condition as it actually is. He won't go into his own proof of his lost condition. You understand that? We are here, first of all, to prove that we don't know what life is all about. Therefore, we're living in falsehood, pretending that we're living in truth. So we take one step into it and it becomes quite a shock. Because every fantasy that you've had, I've had, you've had about your life will have to fade away in the light of seeing the proof right in front of our eyes. And isn't it right in front of your eyes? Not quite. The wars that are going on and your heartache that's going on, you feel that, but I'll, I'll assure you that you haven't taken one step into it and said, this is my pain, this is my anguish. You're not standing aside and seeing that it's there. Therefore, therefore you have not as yet arrived at the point where you can prove to yourself that you're lost. Look, you have to do it for yourself. You have to be so intensely alert all day long just to see that you don't know what you're doing with your whole life. Is there stubbornness in you or in anyone watching this film that won't let you admit that you have a lot of internal exploring to do in order to reach even the beginning of self-proof, which is an admission. Proof of living in falseness is an admission of it. Now, if you're going to get mad any time anyone points out your shortcoming, your anger, your deception, if you're going to get mad, you have refused the self-proof of your own false life, which if you would destroy the stubbornness, give it up, you could pass on through. And the passing through of the falsehood brings you to the point where truth is proved. And truth is proved simply by getting rid of all the falsehood. There's no other way to do it. You try to escape from that fundamental point that truth is proved by first going through falsehood. Try to distort that in any way and you'll never succeed. You'll only get yourself deeper in the confusion. And I'll illustrate the whole point of what we've talked about up to this point. Here's a tourist who goes to a distant fishing village. He's going to spend the weekend fishing. So he goes up to the coastal city checks into the motel, gets up early in the morning, gets his fishing rod out, goes down to the edge of town and before him, two or three blocks, is the shore, the beach. So he's all excited about all the fish he's going to catch and all the fun he's going to have. And he takes his fishing pole and he walks through the sand all alone down to the shore. And he walks over to the left for another two or three blocks until he can find a perfect place to sit down and cast his line out and have a pleasant morning and afternoon fishing. So he wanders quite a distance from the village finally and he finds just the right spot, a little low hill that he can sit on and throw his line out and fish in the surf. And he's so interested in his fishing and also in his own daydreaming of which he is unaware by the way probably daydreaming of catching the biggest fish in the ocean. He doesn't notice what is happening around him. 
And as the hours go on, this is what is happening around him. The fog starts to creep in. And at first, because he's so intensely occupied with his daydreams and with his actual fishing, so occupied with that, he doesn't notice it. He just out of the corner of his eye, he notices at a distance a slight thin fog coming in on both sides and in the back of him and in front of him. And it's only for two or three hours, two or three hours later that he notices it's getting fairly close to him. But he's still so fascinated by the idea of catching fish, which he does, and he wants to catch more so he can show everybody what he caught. It's only till, until late afternoon that he notices that it's too foggy to fish. You can hardly tell which way the ocean is because in his position it's hard to tell. The fog is so close. So he finally reels in the line and decides to go back to his motel. But now, because he hasn't thought about the direction back and because the fog is so thick, he doesn't know which way to go. So he wanders around, he stumbles and falls down a few times. And he understands he's no, in no great danger, but he's, he's kind of humiliated in his own mind, embarrassed that such a simple task as finding his way back to the village it can't be done. Just at that point, a patrolman comes along with a flashlight flashing in the fog and comes up. And they greet each other and the fisherman's a little bit relieved. And the patrolman says, uh, I think I've arrived just in time, haven't I? And the fisherman laughs a little bit, that's right. And the patrolman says, uh, I'm going back now, would you like me to uh, lead you on back to the village? But in back of the fisherman's little good-humored laugh was a good deal of pride, a good deal of vanity. Because all his life, he had a certain image of his mind, in his mind, of being a very self-reliant man. And more than that, he'd had a lot of boyhood experiences in which the thing he despised most of all was to be laughed at. The one thing that he hated, that he'd do anything to avoid, was to have people laugh at him. And in his confused mind, listen to this please, this is called paranoia. In his paranoid mind, he even wondered if that patrolman in his uniform and his badge and flashlight and offering to guide him back, he even wondered if that patrolman was laughing at this poor pathetic tourist who didn't have sense enough to go back when the fog was coming in. And he also, more paranoia, attributed to the patrolman a certain superiority to him. He felt that the patrolman was saying, look how smart I am, I can lead you back to the village and you can't. All these, all these tormenting ideas went through his mind. So he said to the patrolman, oh no, I can find my way back. No need for you to help me. So the patrolman said, all right, and wandered off. And the man wandered around a little more, feeling a certain, certain false pride in having said that he was independent and could find his way back, at the same time internally paying the price for his falsehood, for his false state. And he wandered around completely lost for the next two hours and finally the patrolman came back again and said, would you like to follow me? And his vanity, which is so deep, wouldn't cease. So he said, no thanks, I'll find my way back. But the patrolman, having gone through this many times over the years, understood what was happening inside the man and deliberately walked in a certain way which the man could follow him on back to the village, which he did. I have described you briefly our state, the state of utter stubbornness in which we don't want to admit that we're lost. And do you see what happened? When he finally, this is just an illustration, and life is not an illustration, so we have to leave the story pretty much in a minute and go on to other matters. But do you see, suppose, suppose he had said right at the beginning 
I sure am lost. That would be an admission of his own lost position, would it not? And he could have followed the patrolman back. And when he got back to the village, truth would appear. The truth of being where he should be. But he had to admit that he didn't know where he was and then follow, if he could have, followed a higher authority on back to the village. Now I want to tell you about a very, very specific area, a lost condition, a falsehood, which you all will have to enter and go through. Now I will tell you, it's pretty deep and it's pretty profound, and you're going to have to listen carefully while I describe to you, while I describe to you a certain kind of a fog that you are living in. And if you get angry, if you resent the fact that I say that you're in a fog, can't you study that and see that that resentment over me saying you're in a fog is part of the fog? Even the admission that you're in the fog can begin to take you out of it, right? All right, now listen. This may be new to you. There's a certain false condition, a heavy mental fog, a falseness, which you can begin tonight to prove for yourself. That is, you prove the existence of this fog by entering into it as I explain it to you. That is, you admit to yourself that this is the way your mind and emotions operate. And it is so clear, the way I'm going to describe it to you is so clear, there is no way you can escape it if you have an ounce of sincerity and honesty and if you really want out of your own foggy life. The fog that you are all in is that of voices. The fog that you're in is that of foreign voices, alien voices, speaking to you all day long and telling you what to do. Now these voices are thoughts. In the form of thoughts. You see the thought speaking to you? Can't you hear it speaking to you? Did you hear it today talking to you? Now these thoughts are not your thoughts at all. They don't belong to your true nature. They come from the outside and they invade everyone on earth who's still lost in the fog. They invade anyone with a persistence that you would never be able to comprehend until you get to the end of it. And then you'll see how persistent they are. And with a a fierceness and with an evil and with a cunning and with a trickery so cunning that they they trap for their entire life practically every human being on earth tonight we're going to expose their voices I'm going to tell you all about them and when I tell you about them, your recognition and admission is when you say, that's right. That happens to me all the time. You have described me. You have described my foggy condition that I've wandered around in trying to find my way back home. But I haven't found my way back home. These alien, evil voices speak to you and you unfortunately as yet hear and obey for example these voices can talk about sex sex being a very sensitive subject a very emotional subject and a very personal subject these voices can take just the subject of sex alone and talk about it in different voices even in a thousand different ways 
with the only purpose to confuse you, to make you ashamed, to make you feel guilty, to make you feel as if you can never break out of that fog. This is their purpose. They put crude sex thoughts in your mind, or they even bring up abnormal sex practices that you've maybe seen in a magazine or that you've heard about and that are very embarrassing. There, there's no, there, I will repeat a favorite phrase of mine. There is nothing too low for these devil voices to put into your mind regarding sex. And once they have put them in your mind, you, because you don't understand yet, you're still in the fog, will listen to the voice and think that it is yours. Then it speaks again and accuses you of being degenerate, of being a horrible man, a horrible woman with all these terribles. Look, I'm just talking about one area alone, sex thoughts. And you know how many other areas there are in life they could talk about. Your greed, your ambition, your lies, and so on. So these thoughts, which come from a very dark place, way down deep underground, come up and present themselves to you as necessary as legitimate and most insidious of all, they present themselves as being you. They present themselves as being your nature. And this is why you feel ashamed. This is why you feel, oh, I'm glad nobody knows the thoughts that go through my mind because I am so terrible. You know you've just identified with those thoughts. They are not you at all. Now listen to this. By automatic habit, you have said to these thoughts, you reply to them, and you say, I hear and obey. But this reply to them, I hear and obey, is simply a part of of the voice, another voice, a second voice that speaks after that. It's a still a part of the old nature that falls into the trap that thinks you have to obey, feeling ashamed, feeling guilty, and you fall right into it wholeheartedly. Let me give you a very specific example of the cunning, and don't forget that word, the trickery, the evil of these thoughts. And you remember this, and maybe you'll never fall into this particular one again. Can you recall at a time in your life when you were insolent to someone? These wicked voices will warn you, listen to this, will warn you against being insolent to their attempts to humiliate you, to make you feel ashamed. They say, you remember how you were punished when you were insolent to your parents? This is the voice still talking. You remember how you were punished, how bad it hurt when you were insolent to your parents and they reprimanded you for it in one way or another? Do you remember how it pained you? The voice is still talking, and the voice says, if you are insolent to me, you will be punished. And now you remember the pain of 40 years ago when you were a child or whatever, and you say, I don't want that pain, and I don't want to be insolent. To be insolent is bad, therefore, I won't be insolent to you by fighting against you. I will obey and you fall right into it and you feel ashamed. Do you understand so far what I'm talking about? Yeah. All right, we'll go back again. There are dark voices of which you are unaware, which you're not acquainted with. You're not acquainted with their operation. 
which means you're going to have to be far more watchful of your mind. Just as you were listening to me tonight, can you think back during the last two or three days, even today, and think of some mental torment that went through you? Can you think of something that happened to you that caused an emotionalized thought that caused discomfort or pain? This was a voice. See, you think that it is legitimate, that it is necessary for you to suffer. You're, you, you vow that it's necessary. And to you it makes logic, very illogical logic, because you've said this is the only way it's ever been for me to suffer. And so you take it as necessary to suffer. I'm giving you the way out tonight. I'm telling you that you're going to start to listen to the evil voices that talk to you all day long and tell you how to behave and then when you behave according to their own wicked instructions you get in trouble and they laugh at you. They laugh at your stupidity and then you believe the stupidity and say that's me and you go into more agony. And there's no end to it, is there? You know it. There's no end to it. There will be an end to it if you add something else to your life. If you add the following to your life. Listen to this. Here's the way out. In summary form. This voice of accusation trying to make you feel guilty and ashamed over the past trying to make you feel feel as if you're a failure in life. You listen to this voice. It's essential that you hear it, you understand? You hear it. And you say, I hear and I don't obey. All your life you've been saying, I hear and I obey. And you didn't even know you were saying that because that's part of your unconsciousness. And that's the, what these dark voices want you to be. This is the state they want you to stay in. And when you're really aware of them, when you catch them coming, over anything. You're trying to break a habit. Look, you're trying to break a habit and you can't break the habit. It just keeps on what it is. And the voice accuses you and says, look, it'll, it'll find a thousand varieties, I assure you. It'll just about the habit you can't break. It says, you can't break the habit. That shows you have no willpower. That shows you're weak. That shows that you ha have no initiative. You have no persistence. That shows that, that you're a nothing. You can't even break a simple habit. You watch how it accuses you in a dozen different ways. And any time you hear a voice, which is a thought, out of the dark place and out of the past, any time you hear a voice that accuses you and you feel pain, the very noticing of the pain is the exposure of the voice. You know that it's now talking to you and trying to get you under its power again and again and again. If there is discomfort in a mild way, if there's sheer overwhelming agony or anywhere in between, I want you to know, I want you to realize that you have been spoken to by an evil voice that you don't have to obey at all anymore. I hear and I don't obey. And if you do this long enough, with this real earnestness that we're talking about. Here's what will happen. This is an accurate prophecy now. If you want it. If you want out of the fog. As you notice these accusing voices. These low life voices. As you notice them. And simply understand that it is not necessary for you to obey. Because truth which you are trying to acquire doesn't have to obey. If you understand that, the voices will grow both weaker and weaker and less frequent, less often. They won't come at you some more because they are not getting their evil reward over scaring you, over making you feel 
like a, the, the lowest human being on earth. That's their purpose. And you are going to continue to listen to them? I've told you, you don't have to. Now back to the original point. You have to go through the fog. You have to go through wilderness in order to prove its existence. And to prove its existence means that you, you can't live in daydreams anymore, that your life is all right. You have to see that you're lost in the fog, you see? This is the honesty. Now, when you know that you're lost in the fog, that's proof of his existence, isn't it? Isn't it? You know you stumble and get hurt all the time. You've got all this stubbornness that won't let you admit that you don't know the way back to the village. You pass through the fog of seeing what you're actually like because these voices are telling you what you're like and then you'll see that you don't have to listen to them and when you see that, then that's the proof of truth, isn't it? I am telling you. What I've told you tonight is a true inner journey one that you can take from the fog, from the falsehood, go through it all the way by working real hard to catch these voices when they talk to you and don't listen to them because you don't have to. And if you catch just one out of a thousand a day, that's great success. And the next day you'll catch two, and the next day you'll catch five maybe. And you'll see your nature change. You're becoming real. You're becoming true. And it's truth that is doing the work for you. And this is how you recognize truth, because you first recognize falsehood. And you see the proof that truth actually exists, because you are beginning to live it in a small way at the start. And then it increases and increases. And you know from yourself, whether anyone else knows it or not, you know that something absolutely miraculous and marvelous is happening to you. It's a very silent and powerful thing. Silent and powerful and sure. And you'll know you're changing. This means, this means that you have recovered your own real life that was waiting for you all along. It's yours and you know it from yourself. And we'll take a 10 minute break. In higher control of your life, you must first lose illusory control. Illusory control consists of the stubbornness that we talked about. It consists of ideas you have about having a life and power of your own which can change things, which can move things, which can create things, which can cause things to happen. And what you can do is simply interact with other evil people hurting each other, and then you say, I have control because I hurt the other person. All this is part of the madhouse. Now you will have to go through the fog of seeing that you have no control of your life at all. None. First place, there's no controller. You don't even do practical things of yourself. There's no self to do practical things. There's simply right forces that tell you to brush your teeth every once in a while. They cause you to go to work to earn money so you won't starve. Even those don't belong to you, so you can't claim those as having control of your life. In order to have authentic control, you must lose all control. And when you start to do this, the voices will never be more fierce. When you have determined to lose illusory control of your life, this means you are beginning to fade out as the center, as the center of the doer, the person who is doing things, the actor in the sense, the one who is acting and doing things. The voices will attack in a thousand different voices, a thousand different intensities. They will plead, they will scream, they will threaten, they will promise, they will lie. They will do everything to pre prevent you from continuing in your very right aim of losing control of your life, which merely means to go through the proof of your wilderness 
of the wrongness of seeing you never had any control at all. Even the power to hurt someone else is not control. That's just madmen hurting each other. That's all it is and doesn't need further explanation than that. But the main point is, when you decide that you are no longer going to control that habit, as if you ever have, there's just mechanical things happening and it fell into a certain pattern and that continued. When you've determined that you're no longer going to have the pretense of control of anything at all in your life, the devils will scream. And if you let them scream all they want for years and years and years, you will then see you never did have control and then you will see beautifully, you, you don't need control. It is your needing of control that gave you no control. Are you following? Yeah. Of course. When we thought we had control, we went around doing evil to ourselves and to everyone else. Attributing to ourselves power, the power of decision, the power to help people. And the illusion of helping people is destroying people. Watch for their voice when you start the voices when you start to say I'm going to investigate this idea of commanding and non-commanding my life I'm going to see that I have no command at all and I'll tell you it's a beautiful state to have no command of your life at all personally would you like to guess who then is com commanding your life controlling it you know the answer to that don't you something that is not you called truth. Two volunteers. I have a question. Sir. Go ahead. Or just a comment. Um, is it not a fact that all big things that we heard tonight about figures and such should, should not be taken out of this room nor discussed with anyone outside the class? Absolutely. <laughs> and Joe, be very discreet from now on and don't tell too many things like that because there's devils in this room. There are devils in this room. Someday you'll, you'll know when to open your big mouth and when to keep your big mouth shut. And pray for the hastening of the day. Yes, Stella, you're quite right. Yes, Jean. Uh, in the story tonight, the fisherman in the fog, all his thoughts that uh, he put his craziness on, onto, onto the uh, man who came shown the way, well, that's all the thoughts that people put onto you. You know, I confess I didn't, I didn't understand. The story tonight. Yes. Uh, the, the fisherman in the fog yes. transferred all his insane thoughts, all his vanities and everything, put all this stuff on the policeman. And in the same way, the people do that to you. Oh yes, yeah, I know that. I know that. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your time trying to attack me in any way at all. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, did, were you, now, uh, if you, a question or up front? Were you up front before? All right, don't raise your hand if you were up front on this little technique before. One. Uh, let's see, we want a partner for you. Uh, have you been up before, partner? No. Come on, partner. <laughs> each, re each read and receive two sentences, two apiece. Then we can cover a lot of ground. First read. An unawakened mind is like a sailboat pushed around by changeable winds. Yes, because people feel that they have control of their life while outside forces control them entirely and they're unaware of that. Most people crave to be told that it is not their fault, which is why most people remain in pain. That's because we are right and everybody else is wrong. Lies and deceit may be part of a person percent present. Lies and deceit may be part of a person's present level, but they are not permanent obstacles to a higher level. Yeah, and believing that they are, you, we would continue living that way in eternity unless we had somebody to tell us that we don't have to. We should keep in good 
we should keep in good with rightness because it makes no sense to do anything else. That's right. <laughs> Hands. Regina and Hal would be good. And then um, Randy and who, let's see, let's see a lady. I want to see a lady in the room. Let's see a lady. Were you up before? No. All right, you're a lady with Randy. Like the particular sentence in a book, truth is within, but requires our diligent search. That's true. Uh, the truth is covered up by the distortion of our own outer mind and our own consciousness. And our <clears throat> ideas surrounding it. Face audience, yeah. Yeah, half, uh, three quarters at least. Each other and audience half. If our present ways do not supply self-command, it makes sense to drop them for ways that do. Um, we've spent our whole lives, uh, our whole lives are proof that we do not have self-command, and uh, it's time to drop what hasn't worked for something that will. Mm. There is no way to make sense out of human affairs, for there is none, and to see this makes the calm sense you need. The human affairs are just the outer rationalizations for not doing what is within us. Okay, was that two? Three? Yeah. Fine. No, uh, wait a minute. Uh, who are the f other first two? Do we have the uh, two couples? All right, Amy and... Brent, can I make a comment? Yeah. Um, could they speak up? Because there's no amplification on no. the speakers in the back. Real loud and clear. Lunacy thinks sanity is lunacy. Lunacy thinks that sanity is lunacy. And that's why it's lunacy. It's because it can't recognize what it is. Insolence is weakness masquerading as courage. When I'm insolent towards somebody, I think I'm right, I think I'm, I'm strong, I think the other person needs that uh, attitude being expressed towards them. And that's not right, and that's not strong, that's weak. We need not choose a self-damaging reaction. And that's freedom. But all we, all we know now is to choose the self-damaging and like Vernon said this evening we have to see that that's what we're choosing. Did you both have two? two. Oh, go ahead. Only ignorance craves the worthless. I'm very ignorant because I crave things like attention from other people, um, material objects that aren't going to do anything for my eternity. Hands. Remember now, if you were up before, don't raise your hand. Uh, yesterday, for example. All right, Kim and Zena. When you've given your answer, then you go into reading the sentence for the other person when you're through. You're always first on the my right. Whether understood or not, the cause of all suffering is a false idea of who we are. Well, we refer everything back to ourselves, and we and we always think we're a victim. Sanity. 
Seeking the answers to life on the intellectual level alone is like seeking the sun on the ocean floor. <clears throat> the intellect only knows the intellect and that's all. It, it can only try to um, fool you <clears throat> thinking that it's going to show you more, but it won't. All right. That was a good answer. What are my present attitudes toward life, and what kind of life have they produced? The yeah, there's some. Sometimes you have to get one that uh, stands alone. The only reason anyone needs for becoming whole is that it is better than being split. Would you read that again? That the only reason. Oh. <laughs> the only reason that anyone needs to be whole is because it is better than being split. Well, that is uh, the purpose of our class, is to learn how to become whole and to see that we are split. And we're all in pain. We're becoming aware of that. And as we become aware of this, being split will lead us to the wholeness. Desperation is simply the false product of the false self, which is cured easily and eternally by your real self. Uh, desperation is a part of the false self and uh, the false self needs this desperation to keep it going or it wouldn't exist. One reason these questions or statements are hard to add to is because they are very complete in themselves. Mm -hmm. And when you hear it, your mind says, what more need be said? <laughs> That's right. Which means you can now go to double work to add something to it. We always do the hard thing. Uh, Paul, I always get matches, Paul and B. Imagination based in vanity is not intuition. Imagination is just a bunch of mental movies and regarding the past and in no way be tied to anything that's true and right. Cosmic com command contains no anxiety for it is quietly content to remain with its own natural home. <coughs> the reason that we're anxious is because we're not whole. We're trying to complete ourselves and in doing so we must anxiously go around in that process. <coughs> With wholeness, there is no anxiousness. And that's it. I just ran across one that was given before. <laughs> <laughs> True teaching will never let you... Paul, you'll create a problem, man. <laughs> There's no problem, you'll create one. <laughs> a true teaching will never let you evade the fact that you are responsible for yourself. We constantly evade responsibility by saying it's someone else's fault or someone else should be strong for me. Truth won't let that us get away with that. It is those who do not know who angrily argue. That is, that's obvious. You go out in the world and 
you can spend 15 minutes anywhere and watch people around you and everyone is trying to convince everyone else that they know. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's just everywhere. My job, the, I, half of the conversation that takes place is a false, needless uh, desire on one man, for one man, to tell everyone else that he's right, right. and that he knows what he's doing. Right. What a waste. Uh, Jim and Marta. <coughs> the rightness of the invisible world knows how to handle the wrongness of the exterior world. Because when you're uh, not in, when you're egoless, you can see everything. When you're nothing, you can see everything. Most people crave to be told it is not their fault. Um, no one sees the truth he does not want to see. This is very, very obvious, especially with new people who come here and they're told the truth uh, about themselves and, and they don't want to see it. Uh, we had an excellent example. There was a woman here who turned around and said to Vernon, how can you say you know me when you never met me before? And just by looking at her face, and she, you could tell, but no, she no. wouldn't, she couldn't hear the truth. Conflict is not a mystery to be complained about, but a condition to be solved. We can learn from our conflict. Continued confusion indicates a lack of self-responsibility in some way. Yeah, when, we, when we are told about our confusion here, and unless we start to see it and do something about it in a constructive way by coming to the classes, by working, we will continue with it. And that's not going to free us from it. Let's see. I did see the hands of Bonnie. Didn't I, this Bonnie? Didn't I see your hand, Bonnie? And I did see the hand of Linda way back there, didn't I, Linda? <laughs> Um, another added thing that would make it difficult is to prevent from breaking the binding as you open the composite command book. What, what did you say? Uh, when they open the book, not to break the binding. Yeah, open gently and stuff. Uh, there is a feeling of relief, even in, deci in deciding to try to do what is right with your life. Yes, after having missed a few classes because of things, I observed what I really have learned here and how valuable this class really is. Authentic wisdom is one with calmness. And that is something I'm lacking right now. <laughs> <laughs> We might as well settle it once and for all that there is no way to accept self-change through self-study. Could you read that again? Yes. I better wash my writing if that's what it was. <laughs> oh, I don't read, too well. read it again, please. We might as well settle it once and for all that there is no way out except self-change through self-study. Yes, I've seen a million cases of that already, and I, you tell people you don't need to be unhappy. You just can't tell them anything. They don't hear you anyway. I'm just glad that I can see it myself. <coughs> Happiness exists when the inner man rules outer things, while unhappiness exists when the outer rules the inner. 
Well, with myself, I have realized that the outer things have not made me happy, and it's myself mm -hmm. on the inside that I want to. Right. You know. right. Right. Okay, we'll take one more set. Two more people, then we'll go home. Hands. Let's see. You haven't been up, Jane. Yeah, been you have or haven't? I have. Oh, no, no double dealers here. <laughs> uh, Larry, have you been up? See, I have to ask you, idiots. I tell you ten times, and then Jean raises her hand. What does that make you, Jean? I want to. <laughs> hand. Who? Gloria. 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 Yeah, use your glasses. Yeah, sure. Good old Barbie volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> to live in, an, in another world, be another world. I will not know another world unless I see the world in which I'm living is a wrong world. False self-certainty shakes its possessor, but the very shaking is a guiding message to willing listeners. Could you read it one more time? False self-certainty shakes its possessor, but the very shaking is a guiding message to willing listeners. Do you understand it? I, I think so. I don't like that, I think so. The only way you can see yourself is to feel you're shaking. Am I on the right track? <laughs> <laughs> Beats me. <laughs> The one way to travel, travel from anxiety to peace is to be willing to travel from the known to the unknown. If I am an anxious, nervous person, I will never know what calmness is until I can see the punishment that the nervousness and anxiety puts upon me. <clears throat> Contempt for others has no source but unseen self-contempt. Contempt for others has no source except... <laughs> Contempt for others has no source but unseen self-contempt. Think of the word projection. You know what that means, psychologically? Oh, yes. My mind is a blank tonight. <laughs> okay, fine. Fine. I just want to make one explanation, then we'll go home. Some of you have probably wondered why I use glasses. I don't need glasses to see the print. I need them to see the page. <laughs> Not bad, huh, Duffy? <laughs> Good night. Good night.